for me, like, um, you know, I've been, been there, you know, and um, I made it through it. Like, these are like what I got out of it, you know. I got my tracks, they're gone, you know. I don't have to shoot dope no more. And I got my history on my, on my arms. Anybody work here? I know, I know you people don't like me to work here, but can somebody move my amp closer? There must be a few niggas around.
just gonna be the last time I'm gonna say this. Me and Chuck were sitting over there, right there on the doorstep behind that car. Okay. And all of a sudden, the police pulled up. I said, what the hell's going on here? We were just, I was playing guitar, we were hanging out. And uh, it was funny, because Chuck said, you watch, the coroner's office is going to pull up next. The coroner's office pulled up, and I thought, man, must be some old John, some old, maybe a politician, you never know, who uh, went up there, got laid, and died in the middle of it all. You know, had a heart attack. So we were laughing about it. All of a sudden, the plastic bag came out. and. I didn't see him when he got in town. I didn't see him at, at, at all, other than the time he came out in the plastic bag. And uh, we're saying, God, man, that guy must have died a horrible death. He was bent like a pretzel like this. You're going to follow him. I'm almost positive Thunder said HIV, but you know, like most people that find out they're positive, he de went through denial, you know? You're going to know, not me, but you know. What was this? Oh, yeah. Most people, when they find out they're positive, they go through, I would think, a period of denial. Not me, uh, you know, but, you know, you share needles with people and that's what happens. Johnny was a pip. Too bad. It's sad. If you could have hung in there for another month or two and come back from New Orleans, I could explain everything to him and he might still be alive today. He had just made a big contract with some German studio and, you know, then another deal with Japanese, you know, and he was going to make it. So, I don't know what went on down in New Orleans, but it weren't good. I think there's foul play afoot, Watson. <laughs> first memory of Johnny, which is really kind of amusing, is I was a small time hustling little coke dealer and I was working at a 930 club in, in DC. I was a light man for a band called The Vigil 
and we were backing them up. And they were on their way to England the next day. And uh, we'd all done a little bit of coke. We were snorting. I was a kid. They were, they were all shooting up. But they were worried because they had to go to London the next day. And how were they going to make it on the plane for the flight without the uh, without being able to shoot up in the, in, in the airplane? And would they be able to shoot up in the airplane? And it, was, it wasn't until uh, years later that I ran into them again, you know? And it was at a beer store on St. Peter's Street, the same street where he died. I didn't know who he was at first. I said, you look familiar to me. And he told me who he was. And I said, oh, you want to go get high? And I, you know, I'm fanatical about things. And I was a hardcore junkie at the time. But I don't know. I just wasn't like that. Next thing I know is a couple days later, I hear that he died, you know, half a block from my house. So I'm, I start to get massive phone calls from people saying, uh, what the fuck do you know about this, Danny? We know that's a half a block from your house. We know you know him. Who did it? I don't know. John and I never got in a real fight or anything, but, um, you know, I guess your blood is always bad if you're too adult. Well, let's just walk around. We're rolling this town. Please, go to the next slide. The first day I met Johnny was in the evening time. I didn't personally meet him. We had just come back from um, having donuts and coffee at Cafe Du Monde. And as I was walking past the hotel room, they got an air conditioner unit there and they also have a, a window right there. And I observed him looking out the window. And I noticed, you know, that's my you know, room in that hallway. So I went inside and as I was walking through the door, I met Johnny right there. And um, he told me that he was a musician and he played for the band called New York Dolls, played the guitar. Camera rolling. Well, when um, the New York Dolls started, like maybe uh, six months before they were playing, like um, 
I think the musicians like that hung out in New York were like uh, very into fashion, you know. Like it was a competitive thing, and the dolls had the the look down the best. <laughs> a big following of girls and he just like lift his leg up and he had these like white you know like more t narrow type platform shoes all these girls like grab his leg you know and uh, try and pull him in there in the audience and um, he could handle it he just kind of fall over backwards and make it back to the line back there these beautiful almost marshmallow shoes <laughs> uh, claim to be owned once <laughs> Along with their raw energy and uh, they had like that chord, you know, power sound. And John like had that, you know, rip it up, wind it on down, guitar stuff. It was just they couldn't lose. <laughs> I don't know if they were gearing themselves to success because they were like instant success. 
you know, it was like every time they played, I think it was like the, the real objective of rock and roll, whether it's negative or positive, you know, they, they were a party, and it was a party on stage. He showed me, a, I don't know if it was a magazine or not, but it, had, it did have his picture in it, and that's when I went to start a believer. They were a musician. make one part of his lip go up like Elvis used to. That's where Johnny started playing ball with a lady of Fatima. The only thing is, to be part of the league, your father had to participate and he didn't have a father to participate. My father didn't want to be bothered. So how important was baseball to Johnny? He loved it like he loved his music. He really did. But then he had a father and son thing to go to, and his father didn't take him, and I think that's what got him off altogether. Yeah. <laughs> One incident about the dolls that I can remember was Halloween. History is being made in the grand ballroom of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel tonight. For the first time that anybody really can remember, a rock Halloween party is being held here. As you can see, the guest list appears to be quite unique, as are the hosts of this Halloween party. I'm speaking of the unique group of young men known as the New York Dolls. I remember that when they came out on stage, I mean, it was outrageous to see these boys. I never really met them before. And to see Johnny with the tight pants and the platform shoes and the eyeliner and the hair teased out, it was very shocking. I was beginning to wonder whether my brother was gay or not.
friend of mine called me up one morning and said, did you read the paper? And I said, no. And she said, pick it up. And I, you know, I mean, I was really fucking shocked. Not only that he died, but he was here and I hadn't heard from him, you know. And, you know, I didn't even know he was coming. You know, really. So I called Willie DeVille. And I said, man, what, you know, what the fuck happened, man? He said, oh, it's a bad scene. You know, he said he got in town last night. And I said, he's dead this morning. He said, yeah. I said, you know what it was? He said, no, not yet. He said, they're not talking. The first time I met him, he was wearing them funny platform shoes. And he had that funny hairdo and stuff. All of a sudden, across the street, here he comes in a pink and black leather jacket with his hair all cut back, short. I said, hey, man, you look like I got a haircut. I said, hey, I'm back. How you doing? That hotel is not a hotel that people go stay in. It's not no, a real is, popular if, hotel. If I came people off the road, people don't even know about that If hotel. I came off the road, you know, I'd secret. check into the Hyatt or some, you know, you know what I mean? If you have money, you're going to check into the biggest hotel, or right? Or even a more well-known one. Yeah, or, or, yeah, or, so, or a Royal Orleans or something a bigger, you know. You can't try to yeah, got some money. You know, How do you find out about the hotel? I don't know. Cab driver. Cab driver. No driver. I mean, this is fake. It's weird. Yeah. Cab driver. Oh, that's the weirdest thing. See, the cab driver said he was so loaded. That he dropped them off there and said. He went inside the hotel and said, "Take this man." Take this guy. I can't. I don't know. He's he's messing with my mind. I don't know. Take care of him. And yeah. So. So the cab driver kind of. In a sense, just let him off there, right which is there. strange because it was right next door to me. Oh, yum! <laughs> this is where he's sitting, and that's the room he was in where he was staying. Hey, what are you talking for? Calm down, Mister. Somebody in England came up with this tour, and we were supposed to um, to go to uh, play with Rod Stewart at Wembley Pool. One of the original New York Dolls, Sue Bae, Sue Bae. And we went to this really incredible party. Liberace was there and Sal Mineo. Some of the guys in The Who were there and, you know, and we get a call. And they said, hey, hey, you guys better come over because I think Billy's is, is gonna, is about to OD. Get dressed real quick, you know. We get in the cab. We go to the place, right? Johnny was the first one to get there. And I remember Johnny comes running up to me and he says, Sylvain, Sylvain, don't even go up there. That, of course, is Billy Joel, who was um, the first drummer for the Dolls. He was an intensely fabulous drummer and great guy and never knew what he missed. Just he went straight to London and died. In about a week or so, we were like incredibly famous. If you don't have reservations, please wait outside. Why should we wait down here? So don't don't have reservations. But we do. That's your fault. We call twice during the week. Max's was a wild scene in those days. I mean, it was really crazy. I mean, there were a lot of crazy people in there. Uh, I was sitting front row, right in front of the stage, and behind me was Truman Capote, and uh, you know. I, I, and all these writers and show business people from downtown, they were all big fans of the Dolls, all big fans of the New York Dolls. And, and uh, when, you th when I think back on it, Johnny was still just a kid, man. He was only 18 years old. I don't know if he, if he really realized what he had, you know, a, a chance to have something like that in his hand. Uh, I don't know if they ever controlled it or they, they could control it, you know. He was, to me, he was still just a kid. When I first met him, man, like in the 70s, first New York Dolls Tour of America, he asked me if I was, you know, he said, are you from New Orleans? And I said, yeah. He said, can you school? And, you know, I said, I said well, you know, what are you looking for? And he said, it's, you know, heroin. I said, yeah, I can get something. You know, I wasn't hooked up real bad, but I was using it at the time. So I went and got something. And, you know, I mean, it was, for people in New Orleans, it was decent for us. We were used to it. And he got as fucked up as I did on the stuff. But uh, the next time I saw him, like I said, the first time I went to New York, he made the deal on a gangplank, went back to the hotel, and I mean, Jesus Christ, that was some strong shit. I mean, we got high off that one package for a week. I remember hearing that he was getting high on dope, and um, 
you know, it scared me because uh, I knew he was afraid of needles, you know, and he'd always say, I'm never going to do needles, never, no way. And he'd been doing a lot of downs before that. And, uh, you know, downs are scary, you know, you can't, can't call turkey on downs. So now he was playing with dope and still doing downs sometimes. It, it scared me. And the fact that I knew he wouldn't do a needle himself meant that he was kind of putting his hands in somebody else. So I think probably for like the first year when I heard he was doing dope, um, every time I saw him get high, someone else was shooting him up. And I never realized once Johnny would learn how to do it himself, that it would become even scary because once he learned how to do it himself, then he would really do anything. I suspected Johnny doing drugs when he was still home with my mother. I had a feeling he was, but he wouldn't admit it. He wasn't about to tell me, yeah, I was right. When he moved out, we noticed changes in him, and I know his drug problem was getting worse and worse. I heard stories, which Johnny would never tell me straight out, um, that it really started getting really serious after the dolls started taking off and making money. I remember taking LSD with Johnny one time. And we were so out of it, we forgot where we were. We thought we had gotten to Hollywood. Johnny kept saying, I know we're going to get to Hollywood soon, Steve. We got it. Once we get to Hollywood, I'm going to be a big star. Just stick with me. We're going to become stars, you know? That's the Hollywood yeah. show, folks. Yeah. yeah. That's the Hollywood show. Yeah. You can't get decided. Okay, wait. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can we all look at stick this out? Yeah. 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 I'm trying to get down a little bit. Right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. We get to the, to the airport. Star Magazine girls in, in live now. Here they are, live. There's Sable Star, there's, you know, this one, that one. I forget their names, but Sable, she was the queen. You know, you know she gives them a nice little time, <laughs> and they're married. Johnny had girls calling all the time. All the time. My mother used to complain about the phone. Every time it rang, it was Johnny for Johnny, and it was another girl. Hello. Oh, yes. How are you? I'm doing a documentary film. Yes. Johnny Thunders. He was in the New York Dolls. <laughs>
Yeah. Hey! 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 We were, we were up in Canada, we were coming back, and Johnny, you know, smuggled in like an ounce of speed or whatever, you know, which, first of all, if we would have gotten busted for that, it would have been hot, hot times. So, Marianne calls me up, Johnny's sister, and she says, Selene, what? I'm really worried about Johnny. He was just here and everything, and he's like really running around, and what's wrong with him? What did he take? What did he do? I said to her, don't worry, I'll take care of him because he just called me, he's gonna come over to my house. So I'm calling up some of my friends, whatever. Hey man, I gotta get Johnny a couple of downs. And he's going on and on, he's talking to himself. He's underneath my, my uh, he's making believe he's fixing the bicycles as he's looking for the CIA. He was gone, he was fucking gone. I remember one day him telling me that they split up, he had a fight with the band, and he wasn't with the dolls anymore. And at the time he was starting the Heartbreakers. I always loved that that period because I thought the Heartbreakers were terrific. I really thought they were terrific. That band had so much sound and you know, and so good. It's such great music. Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers are the best nah, punk rock band ever lived. Right here, man. Yeah, right that is what it's all about. Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers caught what punk rock was all about. Fucking, the way he spoke, the way he fucking lived, that was the punk rock. These kids are born, right? You've probably heard this before. But these kids are born. Uh, we're we friends, we're we fun your money. They definitely like were one of the coolest groups, and I think that's the Heartbreakers. Dolls too, but the Heartbreakers were really great. Um, I don't know what made they were both so different, you know. And uh, Johnny Thunder's, uh, it seemed like he was like slumming it in the Heartbreakers, you know. So here we are, we're getting ready to do our first gig in, I guess it was July of 75, 75, yeah. I had just joined a band, we had to get, and this first gig was coming up at CBG just for this, this summer festival. At the same time, I'm, I'm working in the Food and Drug Administration, and I had, I had wound up with a bottle of, it was a, a kind of like an eight-ounce bottle of pure quaalude powder. John pulls me aside, of course, if anyone knows that, and says, uh, I walked, you know, give me the bottle, so I'll take it home and I'll get you the money for this. How much do you want, like 50, 100 bucks? I said, oh yeah, John, 50 dollars is fine. Good. This is before he cut his hair, he still had, the, you know, the rat's nest down to his shoulders with all the shit sticking up in the air and stuff. So the next day we get a call from John, or I get a call from one of the guys saying like, uh, like can I go pick up John at his mother's house in Queens because he's, he's all fucked up, he's like that. So I, I said, what happened? Well, well, apparently he had um, started taking the quaalude powder and got into a fight with his his, his, his brother-in-law and he beat the shit out of him and he flushed the, the uh, powder down the toilet and went like that. And John's face looks like um, he's got bubbles in every direction, like, like Night of the Living Dead. And he's got lumps, you know, because his brother-in-law beat the shit out of him. His brother-in-law was like a truck driver. He could, he could kill anyone. Did you guys ever have any, any fights, any tough times? Uh, Did you ever try to straighten them out? And... Yeah, once. Uh, he was with Julie over the house. And, uh, Vito wasn't born yet. She was pregnant with Vito, I think, if I remember right. And Johnny was getting fucked up and he was getting nasty. You know. One word led to another and I whacked the shit out of him, you know, and, which made me feel pretty terrible the next day because uh, I was about 40 pounds bigger than him and I really didn't have to do it. But sometimes you lose your temper and you don't know what you're doing with yourself. I didn't hear about Julie until word got out that Johnny had met a fine, fine thing with some long legs. 
and he was kind of going out with her and she was like with child you know when he when he first started dating her she was already pregnant and i think he really liked the idea of that that he was going to have a kid and that he was taking care of somebody and i remember him bringing me over to meet her and, and he just seemed really happy you know they had a girlfriend and she was pregnant and he was going to be the father and take care of this kid and, You know, of course, it was going to be Johnny, Johnny Jr., and the first one would be a drummer. Of course, drummers are so hard to find, and the second would be a bass player, and, you know, so they were going to be his dream band, and I think he saw himself as someone that would be able to teach them things and, you know, a way to make them feel like a man. <laughs> both had, uh, he was with Julie then. Our children were both the same age. Julie was a very good mother. Uh, Julie, her whole life was to have children. Baby after baby after baby after baby. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Scott's like, is, is this going to be in the movie? Hi. Okay. <laughs> well, <clears throat> right here, this is my seventh son. This is something I waited for for um, a very long time. I remember Johnny really didn't let her get high for a really long time, but I think just before the wedding, she started to get high a few times. And um, I think he let her have something. Whatever it was that he let her have was, some, was something limited. I think maybe what happened was he let her have a couple of Dolores, and we were all doing dope. Hello, David. How we are you? We have now with us. Hello, John. <laughs> Fancy meeting you here. Would you like a cocktail? Oh, we have with sure. us the fabulous Johnny Thunders of the notorious Heartbreakers. Catch them while they're still alive. We'd like to ask you a few uh, questions about your upcoming European tour. It sounds very exciting. Could you give us a few details on that? Um, we're going to go on tour with a band called the Sex Pistols and the Damned. We're going to... Um, uh, do all of England, all over the small cities, Liverpool, Manchester, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And how about the larger cities, like London? Yeah, and, uh, Manchester, London, Paris, you know, we're going to hit all of them. When I went overseas to do the, uh, the Heartbreakers thing, he wanted me to come with him uh, to be a bodyguard on a tour. We were going to get me a, a gun permit and a whole schmear, and I was going to go bodyguard for them. And, uh, and Cut! His sister, my wife, said, absolutely not. Hey, you ain't going anywhere. Yeah. I guess she figured one male out of the family at a time running around Europe was enough. This was called Bone The phone rang, and it was Johnny. And he said, will you manage the, the new Heartbreakers? He didn't ask me what I was doing or if I had anything else to do or anything, just would I manage him? And I just said yes, yeah, sure I would. So it was like two weeks later, we arrived in London. Johnny had vaguely heard of the Sex Pistols. He liked the name, didn't have any idea of their music. It was astounding. The whole room froze and stood to attention. Thunders, to us, I think, 
personified the rock and roll lifestyle. Would you agree with that? He was an alternative to Keith Richards. If you didn't yeah. like, um, well, you could look up to like someone like Keith Richards and go like Keith Richards is a rock and roll god. If you grew up in London in in the seventies during the punk rock era when the um, the rockabilly punk thing sort of came together, you know, uh, having come from the rockabilly thing and going to see Johnny Thunders being an American and and, and seeing him afterwards and going, hey Johnny, what do you think? And he'd go, hey man, I like Gene Vincent. You know, it was like really cool to meet someone like you know Johnny Thunders who was like a guitar god. <laughs> We used to rehearse in Horton Road in Islington about, um, this was like late 77, and uh, we were just getting getting our chops together, you know, like copying rockabilly records, and uh, there was a bit I couldn't get, but I couldn't get this sort of uh, on a uh, sort of like an A flat, you know, and uh, he just wandered in, you know, he was upstairs and he wandered down, and uh, he said, uh, what are you trying to do? I said, I'm trying to get this... Uh, a uh, bit here, you know, and so he got the guitar and he taught me how to do a Chuck Berry, total Chuck Berry. So that's it, that's what I learned from Johnny Thunders. I couldn't play bass at all when I first played with the Rockettes. <laughs> For the next two years, they never missed a gig, and they never loved a gig. Sure, they were sick, they were mean, they were ornery, they were on methadone, they stole a little kid's tricycle in Wales, they were monsters, but on stage, they were the most brilliant rock and roll band going forward. Well, you take it. We are. We are. 
he had a little secret formula. It was cocaine. And he would like go and play and be so happy and then like run off every five minutes and then we'd have to wait, he'd come back, uh, play, you know, finally he'd just have to leave, you know. And he was, and then, you know, he'd get worn out and, you know, depressed. And it was a good excuse for us all to uh, pool our resources. Then, then we, you know, said, oh, well, I guess, you know, that guitar, I could go sell that in a pawn shop, or, you know, this, this chick looks like she'd be good for some dough, or um, whatever, you know, we get the money together by the morning and go get high. And uh, I guess it was necessary to uh, make the music we were doing because uh, it was based on hostility, it was based on anger, and, uh, you know, it was based on destruction. Destroy, and that's all we wanted to do. And uh, we thought nothing of it. We thought nothing of uh, what we took from people, um, the abuse we put our friends through, and uh, it just didn't matter as long as we got dope. Willie Deville, ah! Willie Deville, no, no one's no. allowed in my room on Sunday. later for I don't know what. I heard rumors from up north that they had found something on them. Again though, I was sitting out on the street just four or five nights ago. I ran into one of them. So apparently they're back out. If he was robbed and beat up in the hotel, then um, probably the noise that I heard that night, mm -hmm. banging up against the wall. But then it couldn't because if she called the hotel and asked him, is everything fine? She what said, What time fine. did you, what time, do you have any idea what time the maid was coming in? And I think it was like 8 o'clock that morning. But at that time, I don't know what time, it, it must have been around 11 o'clock checkout time that she noticed him when she opened About the door. 11 o'clock checkout time. Yes, ma'am. I believe it was a black woman, if I'm not mistaken. So you think that, I mean, how do you think he died? What, what, do, you, what do you think happened? I mean, when I personally seen him laying on the ground and stuff, I did not see his face beat up, you know. I just seen vomit out the side of his mouth. I did not observe a needle stuck in his arm. Um, really couldn't tell you. I mean, he could have been killed with a hot shot. Somebody could have gave him something, bonk, robbed him. What is a hot shot, Michael? A hot shot can be numerous things. Um, poison or something that looks like cocaine. Goes crystal clear, tastes like cocaine. Numbs your mouth. But when you shoot it, that's it. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that he killed himself. I'm not saying that he wasn't killed. But no telling what'll happen, you know? No telling what happened in that area. Because that little whole square right there is nothing but violence, nothing but prostitution, nothing but drugs. You know, in a junkie, typical, for a dollar, they'll probably do anything. If a horse, if a whore, excuse the expression, gives a blow job for five dollars, then you'll know what somebody will do for cocaine. If a horse sells a body, her whole body, and does anything for twenty dollars, then you know what it's like. And that's what goes on in that area. 
and that hotel, you know, was known at times for some prostitution involving in that, known at times for people hanging in that. Johnny's room was here, and ours was in the, you know, right next to him. And it was the only two room where you can, just only two rooms that you can get in, and you walk back out. And when I come in, Mike and him, were in the, he was in the doorway, his room, Johnny was in the doorway, his room, and Mike was standing in the hallway talking to him. And Stacy was behind him. And I walked in, walked to the room, because I went to the store and I dropped the stuff and I eased back out, you know, and I was talking to him, meant to do this myself. And then later on, we had all got together and we had some money. When Stacy come back, had some money, we ran into him and, you know, we went drinking. Who is this Stacy? Stacy's my ex-girlfriend. Yes, ma'am. Well, you see, we were in the room. Me and Mike was in the room for about 30, 40 minutes. And she come back with about $60, $70 was on her. And we went, you know, after about 30, 40 minutes of waiting, we had, she had come back because we were waiting on her. She come back, gave him the money, and we all went out on it, you know. Went drinking, that's when we met up with Johnny, and we went to Paddle. Stood there and got pretty drunk. Wait, so I just want to, like, so it makes sense, you know, right? What? So she went out to do what? I mean, can you tell us what she, what oh, she what went she out? to do? Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, her description, I don't know, she went out to make money by getting, you know, blowjobs. heard about my dad's death I didn't know who he was and I heard my mom yelling on the phone and she hung up and I said what was that all about and she said nothing and I said what was that all about and she said nothing I said come on tell me and she says nothing I wasn't yelling about nothing I says if you're talking to someone like that you had to been something had to been wrong if you swear that loud she said she says your dad died and I said what and she says your dad died and I said why don't you ever tell me about my dad when I asked you to call him and stuff and she says because um, he did drugs and used to beat me up and all this, all this time and he's not a good man I want around you. Three days later, my mom says, you have an aunt that lives in New York. And I says, I do. And then I said, can I talk to my aunt one day? And she says, yeah, you can call her in a few days. So two days went by and then my mom calls her and I talked to my aunt for the first time. And then when I got off the phone with her, I asked my mom, I said, mom, can I go down and visit my aunt sometime? She said, um, yeah, I'll let you go down sometime, maybe the summer or something. So, um, the summer came, and I came down to visit. I saw all my cousins, you know, my grandmother and my uncle for the first time. I went downstairs, and my cousin Danny said, you want to see your dad? I said, yeah. Because I never saw a picture of him. And then he showed me some pictures. He says, here, you want this picture? And I said, yeah, sure. And started giving me pictures. My aunt gave me a shirt of my dad. And she was telling me stuff about my dad. Johnny lived here for quite a while, off and on. Whenever he had no place else to go, he'd come here. He'd pull up in a cab. He'd pull up in a cab. Say, I'm here. And stay. Well... He never had any set routine. He would just come and stay. Stay for weeks at a time, sometimes, sometimes just for a couple of days. And then he'd leave. Uh, he knew there was always someplace room to go. Can we hear 425? 425, anybody, for this picture? $1,000 for this picture. 
Going once. <laughs> going twice. Anybody? Eleven hundred. <laughs> she means it. She's serious. Eleven hundred. Maybe we're gonna start a war here. I think she's saying fifteen hundred. We got fifteen hundred up here. Johnny Thunders by Bob. Fifteen hundred once. She looks like she means it. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Fifteen hundred. That's great. Fifteen hundred twice. All right. Fifteen hundred dollars for the lady in the balcony. <laughs> I hear that the chick who bought the picture was a dominatrix and she made her slave buy the picture for her. And then they gave the picture to Roger. She must have whipped him up a little bit and they, you know, maybe he didn't eat out of a dogfish bowl that night. Dog but I heard the guy beat it though, he disappeared. Well, maybe he, you know, I don't know. I guess he was a little pissed off. Maybe he wasn't so dominant. Maybe not for $1,500, yeah, anyway. $1,500, though, I mean, he must have It's a lot of ass whipping. Yeah. Say hi. Maybe you want to come with us to the country. So what did you find out about, you said there's some newspaper articles written lately? How about this? You know about this. So what happened? Tell them. Well, there were articles that are still being written up in, uh, two, three weeks ago. There were articles written, written about the, the incident. I don't know who was about, I think it was more about the incident. And then, you know, the ongoing. There must be some kind of an investigation going on. That's what they for them to say? For them to continue to write articles. Well, who, who said they had an article? My sister-in-law lives down there. Did she send it to you? No, she's got it. I said, hold on to it. She read <coughs> the article. Right she read it to you over the phone? Yeah, no, she didn't read it to me. She just told me that she had the articles. I told her, hold on to it. Did they say anything in the article about an investigation going on? Uh, basically, what happened, and uh, they're, they're, they're looking into more. There's more things that keep coming up. I want to figure out where he was just to push it over, because, you know, just to push it off as an old and that's it, you know? Well, there's things that are unsettled. They have to be settled. We have to find so out, you know. What, what happened with you or the situation with you down there? With the police? Yeah. They just keep hanging up on me. They keep telling me they don't know I'm Johnny, if I'm Johnny's sister. Uh, it's not my business. Sure. They just don't care. Well, it's not right. They figure this guy comes from New York and just because you had a background and drugs. Well, that's part of it. That's you that's what it is. Turn around and just drop it and say fuck. It. Plus, you're dealing with the South. You know, you guys from New York. It's it. It, it really they, is. They also know how time tends to. Yeah, they figure we'll push it off and sweep it under the carpet, push and that'll be the end of it. We're not gonna be able to. But we're not letting it go. What do you think happened? I really don't know what happened. It's not adding up right. There was some kind of foul play. What exactly, I don't know. I don't know if he was robbed before he died, after he died. There's these two shady characters. They keep coming up in different places with different stories about him. He had a lot of stuff, and it's all missing. Well, I, I think the reason Johnny Thunder's, uh, you know, made slumming it is the right word, even though we're all living in the slums, you know. Like, I think the relating to, like, how our look went down the drain, like our clothes, we couldn't get the right gear anymore. It's because we, all our drug habits had gotten very serious. Um, they um, were fueled by, um, you know, being in the bands and, like, having, like, living in an illusion. And, uh, you know, Now I want to sniff some glue. Like well, that that's um, like comes out of an adolescent um, trauma that all us kids probably went through, and I guess all the kids had to sniff it, you know. What do you want to say about that? Now I want to have something to do. Now I want to sniff some glue. It's really What's a frustrating. Uh, it's really just a frustrating thing, you know. What is because there was nothing else to do but just to sniff glue. What's we got that? something better to do now. We were coming out of a hallway, and this, like, lunatic burst in there, threw a karate kick, and held a knife up. And I, I said, man, that's no way to do it. I mean, you know, kick a guy with sneakers? Come on, you know, the skinny little guy. We just pushed him out of the way and walked out of the door, but somehow I got caught. It was no big deal. It was just part of life then. But we go upstairs, and... um. 
we were obviously a bit drained, you know. We didn't want to go back down there. And John was there, and he was like complaining. He said, oh, get us some dough, get us some more dough. I said, no, 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 no. And he wouldn't like uh, take the hint. I said, go get it yourself, you know. And um, he said, uh, no, you know, uh, he was like demanding it. Like he had like seniority in the uh, clique there or something. You know, he was the top guy. And I wasn't going for that then because I was like Dee Dee Ramon now. You know, I said, this is like really rude of this guy, you know. Treat me like this, order me to go get the dope. I'll get it if I want to and if I don't, I won't. So finally I was like drained and I said, John, why the hell would I go get some dope for you right now? You know? And he said, well, so you have the privilege of hanging out with a rock star. <laughs> You know, I, I just uh, didn't know what to think of things anymore. I just wanted to be by myself, you know. But um, John, I, I would just avoid him from then on. And that was like my life. He ripped off my ex-boyfriend for a guitar, who he borrowed and then pawned. Are you filming this now? With the notes? You don't want more in-depth? Let me see this outfit. My. Turn around now, let me take a look at this. Oh, a good spankable behind, I see. Very nice. I approve. Look at that, a little butt action there. A little hoochie-coochie butt action. Very nice. Little titties that I can pinch in there. That's right, little titties I can pinch in there. Are you all ready for me to rip you up, mm. slave boy? Yes, Mr. Sanastasia. Yes, you are. What a nice corset. And look at this interesting cock uh, ensemble. Did you make this? No, mistress. Very nice. Very, very nice. I approve wholeheartedly. Very nice. Very, very nice. Shall we have him sit here while we read this? Okay. Okay. Now, which stories do you want? We were playing a show somewhere in Michigan, a college down Grand Rapids or Lansing or something. And uh, it was like on their New Wave night, New Wave Wednesday or whatever. And, and the place was fucking packed. I mean, they were lined up. We were into a percentage, you know. We were going to make a pile of money for us in those days. I mean, we didn't make big time rock star money. But for me and Johnny Thunders, this was, you know, some thousands of dollars. And uh, the, the show was tremendous. And this was about the time of the Ayatollah and all that. And, and we used to do this version of my Sharona that we changed into Ayatollah. 
Johnny would get in his kind of his pretend political rant, you know, like he actually understood what was happening in world politics or something. And we're using the, the club's office as a dressing room. He's gonna move to Queens, I heard. Johnny's in there in the drawer stealing the club's money. I said, let's get the fuck out of here right now. So pack up all our shit. He gives my girlfriend a big stack of bills and she goes, what do I do? And I said, get rid of the fucking money. So she goes in a ladies room and stuffs it all under the, behind the toilet or something. And then the cops come out and separate us all and start asking us, where's the money? And the guys are going through the office and they're going through the desks and all that. They're adding up, the money's gone, the club's receipts are gone. And at this point, it, I would have I kicked his little Italian ass up and down the street. Because I, and I even said, as soon as I get a bond, <laughs> your ass is mine, man, because this is unnecessary. I mean, I couldn't have want, went better. And here he was robbing the fucking club. And he told me that he stole all his moves from me, and I always thought he really fucked them up. He would come to the MC5 shows and be right up in front. Me and Jimmy got a new band together. So it's Johnny from this gang war. The Wayne Kramer. A teenage idol. Because I always tried, my idols were James Brown and, and Jackie Wilson, so I always tried to have some grace about my moves. And, and Johnny always just seemed like awkward about it. He never really had that kind of fluid motion about it. He was just like perky jerky. You know, I mean, cause all, this was all kind of a, an attempt to try to find a place in the legitimate music business, which of course there was no place for Wayne Kramer, Johnny from this gang war in, in the real world of rock and roll. So um, I guess uh, in, in retrospect, when I look back at now, that we never had a chance <laughs> at, at like being successful. I have a history of drug abuse and, and it was uh, impossible for me to be in a band with this guy and, and, uh, and watch him get off every night and three, four times a day without, you know, me starting to use too. And eventually I was.
He was in the bathroom for a long time. And I would said, look, I'm really embarrassed. You know, I admire you. And I never thought you'd come over here and see. Like, I don't even know where to start cleaning this place up. And he just kind of laughed and said, well, because he always had that fast line. He goes, well, you should start with your bathroom. And then after he left, I kind of knew why. And I saved the needles as souvenirs and stuff. But it was just, <laughs> well, no, I don't know what to say about this. I thought it's like this museum piece or something, because it's like Johnny's actual needle. What we were trying to do in the late 70s is show it, make it very clear. Because when you wore it, at least you knew, I mean, it was, wasn't good enough for me to be rebelling and knowing that I was rebelling. I mean, if I couldn't upset the apple cart, then what good was it to rebel? And in terms of dr sex and drugs and rock and roll, I mean, the whole country was stoned in 1979. So why not? The people that are willing to go to the edge, why, why wouldn't they be shooting heroin? It makes sense to me. Well, that's what was happening. Um, now, there's always a leader. There's always somebody to follow. There was the Elvis that kind of like, you know, made that happen. And there was Mick Jagger who made that happen. And then there were the Beatles. You know, they all made different things happen, but they, they, they were leaders. They were cultural icons. And along came this guy, Johnny Thunders, at Max's Kansas City. And uh, he was uh, the leader of that pack. Well, Johnny spoke the language of the kids that were rebelling. I mean, on the street. Same language. He was living it with them. How many shows do you think you've seen? How many shows have I seen Johnny Thunders play? I'd have to just take a wild guess and say upwards of 500, 2,000 shows between all the different bands he's been in. Every morning when I arise Every night when I rest my head I wish upon a star struck by lightning I can't believe my superhero is dead I wish you were here with me I wish that you were in my band I wish that you could see The way I want to take you by the hand Pull you up, up on the stage now Or get a wild boy and belt out a tune I wish you'd write another page now Your saga ended way too soon Well, I wait and I pray Investigate and then I slay. I take the pain, it really hurts. I go insane. Love comes in spurts every morning when I awake, every night when I rest like a soldier. I wish upon a star, it sounds like fun. And a lot of kids did stick a needle in their arm. I went into Johnny's hotel room one afternoon and uh, lights were down, scarves over the lights. It was a very kind of druggy sort of atmosphere in the room. And, uh, Johnny asked me if I wanted to try some. And, uh, I was kind of excited and, and I did. I wanted to, to, to feel what it was like. And so uh, I said, yeah. And, uh, he basically uh, prepared it all. And uh, so, like, he handed me to do it, and I said, well, I'd, I'd never done it before, so uh, he shot me up. And, uh, as he was doing it, he said that everyone who had ever played with him became junkies. One, two, three, five. Well, Chinese Rocks is about Chinese Rocks, which was uh, a, a name for a street heroine at the time. Somebody called me on the phone. Said, hey, is Dee Dee home? Because Dee Dee wrote the song. The lyrics of the song, like, um, 
basically tell the whole like daily life of someone like me or or anyone that was in that scene in, in New York then. It's like basically, you know, you want to go get some Chinese rock and then you say, well, everything is in the pawn shop because that was the way you got it or you had like a go-go dancer girlfriend and that stuff, you know, and then she'd come in to give you the money and you'd get it for her and you. Or your pals would give you money and you'd rip them off and all. And um, <laughs> I guess that's where John learned that stuff. Uh-oh. Simon, syringes you gave Jesus gave him hepatitis. That's why he was yellow and he couldn't stay in the ground. He rose three times, went to heaven, and now no one knows if he is alive, dead, or just not around. I met Johnny at this point in life, like the bottom. He was depressed, his wife left him, he couldn't see his kids and stuff. I got a phone call one day after Johnny saw me play, and he said, would you want to go on tour? And I said, yeah, right, yeah, okay, yeah. And with Johnny, I said, I don't even know his song. He says, don't worry about it, we'll learn him on the plane. The plane ride was something else because my whole my whole dream was to go on tour with a band. And Johnny's trying to teach me the songs. Here's how Johnny teaches me. He's trashed on the plane. He's saying, Lou, you know, I said, Johnny, how's the song go? He says, don't worry about it. It's in the key of A. It's three chords. The pilot came out of the airplane three times in flight to tell us to calm down. So Johnny taught a whole generation of kids how not to play. And he told me, don't worry about nothing. It's all attitude. It's not what you play. So they came, the police came. They scattered us off the plane and told us the only way to go now we were traveling all night, so we had to wait over all night, and they told us the only other way to get where we were going was to take a train. So he starts to fight on the train, this train going to Vancouver, and guess what happens? They, they tell us to get off the train, and we're in bumfuck nowhere. There were seven cop cars there waiting for us. They, must, they called ahead, and it was like a Sunday afternoon. They tell us the only way to get where we were going now was to get to the bus station. Finally, when we get to Vancouver, I'm in bed with somebody, me and, me and the bass player. We're in bed with somebody. And we hear a knock on the door, and Johnny goes, watch this. This chick Cindy walks in. She was like an angel. She was gorgeous. She was in this white outfit. Um, I couldn't believe it. The first thing she does, she gives us these pills. So we get fucked up on these pills. Let me tell you about Cindy. She left her husband. Five days she's on tour with us. This white jacket turned black. Her arms are like 
pin cushion. I walked into the room and they were just like, they just stopped moving, stopped talking, they just didn't even speak. It was unbelievable. They were just like, you know, nobody said a word for like five minutes. And I said, hi, you know, I said, hello, my name's Sydney. And Johnny got up and shook my hand. And after that, they just sat down and stared at me. And I was humiliated. I thought, my God, what's going on here? I think, what's, you know, did I do something wrong? Or is this really, you know, am I coming in at the wrong time or something? But Luigi and Johnny both said after that, they just didn't know what to say. They were just so surprised. I just, my, this sounds really silly, but they, he was just, they said they were like totally knocked out. And they were just really like, wow, what's she doing here? So, so of course Luigi, or Johnny just grabbed me and said, okay, we've got to leave right now. Took me away from all of them. And he felt so madly in love with me because I left. You know, I didn't stay there with him all night. It was like, he wanted me to hang out with him all night. And I, had, and I left. I walked away because, I mean, I wasn't, you know, I just wasn't into it. I was like sort of going, you know, oh, shit. Let me just double check in here for a minute. Yeah, so I walked out and, um, you know, and he expected me to stay. He just assumed for sure I was going to stay there the night. And we, you know what our first night was like? It was ridiculous. We laid around, and as the night wore on, like he was going, he said things to me, for example, like, um, uh, he said things to me, for example, like, um, oh, God, like, um, we played Vancouver, and the thing about Vancouver, I remember this kid, he goes, who's this fucking guy Johnny? So Johnny walks out backstage, and this kid yells out, he was like a fat Al Pacino, because Johnny was getting a gut at the time, because he was getting lazy, you know? So, um, of course, we get on stage, someone mouths off to Johnny, because the bass plays from the Bronx, I'm from Brooklyn, and the roadie was from the Bronx. We didn't like the, them insulting Johnny, so we started a real fight. We broke the place up, and we had to leave town. Quick. He asked me to marry him the night before, and he wanted to get married on stage in Seattle. We could find a minister. And believe me, he even looked. He was hilarious. I swear to God, he's too funny. And I was like, yeah, of course, I was totally negative to the idea. It was too ridiculous. And um, I mean, I loved him, but I thought, my God, I can't get married to him the second night we're together. It's just too much. San Francisco is the first time I was ever there. It's a cool town, man. People were dynamite. Um, we played Stone Club. Stone Club. And, um, I mean, I was, in, I was on stage, and I, I really don't... All I remember was we're doing a song. All of a sudden I hear, I see Johnny come down on somebody's head with the guitar. Some drunken guy gets up on the stage, and Johnny, of all nights, takes the guitar and whacks the guy right over the head. Yeah, the guy got smashed in the head with the guitar, the whole shit. Yeah. The the Big arrest warrant down for Johnny Thunders in California, yeah, the whole shit. We still have the article in there somewhere. We found out this guy had, had his skull cracked open, and he, he refused medical attention. And the cops wanted to press charges against Johnny. Then the stories went like this, that he went into a coma, he died, and they were after Johnny. But um, I don't think he ever did die, because the guy loved Johnny. Like I said, no matter what Johnny does to you, you love him. I tell you, I hated his guts for years, but there's something about Johnny where you love him. And this guy had his skull cracked open, and he still wouldn't press charges against Johnny. No matter what town we got in, the phone would always ring. People would find him. There's this one porno star named Sharon Mitchell. She knew Johnny. She came to the hotel room. And um, then I got, we got a phone call from Sable. And it's 10 years later. She still loved Johnny. And I kept closing my eyes, and they made love. And I really thought that was a really beautiful moment. But um, I guess, you know, life's like a circle, things come around, you know? And um, they really were in love together one time. 
Then boom, they hit San Diego. They come out of a gig in San Diego and these assholes caught. They stop him and they go, okay, um, are you Johnny Thunders? You know, do the whole big routine. And then um, they stop, you know, inevitably they find Johnny within seconds and take Johnny down and they actually busted him for being under, it was something called internal possession. At that point, I said, this shit ain't working. I took the next plane to New York. That's when I met this guy, Christopher Gear. That fucking Christopher. He's a fucking Nazi motherfucking residential douchebag. Christopher, that was Johnny's manager. He takes a bottle or a glass, smashes it, and it cuts this guy's throat. Christopher didn't think I was good for Johnny, okay? What it was is Christopher was jealous of Johnny and I. He was totally jealous. He was being a total idiot. He's kind of weird, Christopher, because he's really this classy dude. He lived on Lake Street, you know? And Johnny lived on the bottom. And Johnny was a pig. I'm telling you, his clothes were everywhere. All right, he's filthy, always filthy fingernails. And, and Christopher will come down and always clean Johnny up. I tried to make some deals with him. I said, uh, uh, I will never give you any heroin. I will never give you any money, and you should never, if you have money for me, you should never buy any heroin, because I didn't like heroin, and I thought heroin was, was very bad. Uh, so, uh, uh, at one point I said, I give you, uh, I'd rather give you a, a very nice uh, gram of coke. We got pay in cocaine, but guess what Christopher used to do? We always wonder how Christopher made his money, you know? Johnny would walk in, stumble, look for his bag of cocaine, then go down like a mole rat into his hull and get high. It sounds pretty intense, but he'd shoot all night. There'd be blood left all over the walls, all over every single space in the bathroom. There'd be so much blood, you could almost not imagine the room being white again. They would have a bath. They would jump into bed. This is a story about girls who need them in this world. It would just be so exquisitely slow and delicate and loving. And God, I can't even explain it. It's like so, oh, just amazing. started to record in, in 82 something with um, Jimmy Miller. Jimmy Miller is a, he's a, a very good uh, music producer. He, he had been involved with the, the early career of the Rolling Stones and he had a very uh, uh, interesting feeling for Johnny's uh, sensitivity and Johnny's music. Whatever excuse Johnny needed, he would take off. If the earphones stopped working for a few seconds and we'd send a, uh, an assistant engineer down to replace them, I'd turn around, the assistant engineer would come back, I'd say, are they fixed? And he'd say, yeah, I gave him a new set. I'd say, okay, John, Johnny, where's Johnny? Gone, Johnny's gone. Well, I'd usually know where to find him. He'd be in the men's room, and he'd be uh, in the men's room in a stall doing drugs. And I'd say, Johnny, we're ready to go. The cans are fixed. The headphones are fixed. We're ready to go. And he'd say, OK, OK, two minutes, two minutes. And he'd more than likely be 20 minutes. A lot of the problem was, quite honestly, and it's sad to say, but uh, Johnny's veins were very used up at that time. And he used to have to go in extraordinary places in order to uh, to do a hit of drugs. And he'd make love to me for hours. You'd have to catch Johnny, you know, in the right uh, frame of mind for the night. Johnny would quite often blackmail Chris because he was saying this an hour before the gig. Chris had, Christopher had no choice but to provide Johnny with his needs in order to just get him to perform. Don't need no 
blonde no more. I mean, she's so, I mean, when you think about a man who's done that much drugs, and you think that, my God, they can't make love to anyone. He was just like, he knocked me out, he blown me away. He was like, just unbelievable. Uh, there were no record con uh, contracts uh, in America. I mean, there was just the doors <laughs> were, were, were closed. Uh, people, even people who were sympathetic personally or privately to, to Johnny, uh, to get involved and go in the studio or financing anything for him was uh, uh, literally impossible at, at that time. It was probably the smallest budget for a person of his stature that I had ever worked worked with, which made it all the more frustrating when Johnny would disappear for 20 minutes or half an hour because I knew we had four hours to come up with something. So normally, I mean, on a good three or four nights, you can certainly do four sides, four songs in a studio, mixed and everything. With Johnny, it probably took more like uh, 12 to 16 nights. Yeah. <coughs> Johnny would say, Christopher, can I use your, your toilet? And Christopher would say, yes, but you must keep clapping the whole time you're in there, so I know you're not doing drugs. Well, leave it to Johnny. He used to sneak in a little, a little portable cassette machine under his shirt where he had pre-recorded claps. He'd go into the bathroom and turn the machine on, and the machine would constantly clap while he was cracking his spoon and fixing his drugs and everything. That's stupid, but you know, that's why Johnny loved me so much, because I wasn't like some like slut pig from hell. New York was always a, a very violent place where, where people expected also some, some sort of violence. Johnny's on stage and they were doing an instrumental break, I don't remember what song. And Spacely walks on stage. Johnny hates the harmonica. Tell me about the night that we came to your house. Do you remember what you guys talked about? What you guys did? No, we just sat there and shot speedballs, coke and heroin. <laughs>
walking down Second Avenue, right? Oh, was it Third? No, Second Avenue. And uh, there's Johnny, as usual, walks up to me. Hey, Flipper, come over. I'll show you something. He pulls out of his pocket a bunch of fucking Polaroid pictures, right? And uh, I said, I at first, I couldn't even understand what they were. I'm like, what the fuck is this? There's a girl's head from the top. And I was pictures he's thinking of this chick giving him a blowjob. John, the New York Post in an article recently said you change your image, your bad boy image. Mm -hmm. Is that true? And what is it evolution or well, it's, it's growing up, it's growing up and realizing your priorities, I think. You know, it's um it's important to realize, you know, who you are and what you are, you know. I think, you know, and I had a rough time, but now it's behind me. You had a rough time. Mm -hmm. In what way? Can you... Well, I had a terrible problem with um, drugs for a long Did time. You? Yes. And you know, to to beat that and still survive, it's a great education. And you're glad, so glad. Oh, I mean, it's you know, it's great. It's coming alive again. Mm. Johnny Thunder. He beat drugs. Around 1978. 1979, like, Thunders and I kind of, you know, wouldn't really see much of each other. And uh, we did on and off, but it was very short, very brief. And um, I think in 1988 or something like that, I left the Ramones. About, you know, maybe six months or so after I left the Ramones, I got a call from Paris. So, you know, I end up in Paris. Now, Thunders was playing a solo show at Jibby in Paris, and he's sitting there, all depressed, total misery addict. And my heart went out to him. I mean, he was just so sad, you know. And I was shocked, you know. I hadn't realized how bad he could end up. Hey, 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 asshole. If you don't shut up, why don't you go run? Why don't you go stand in the back, okay? It's all fucking free. Hey, you know. I told me it wasn't you. You said your ass to the back or I'll kick you in the face again. Just say Open your fucking mouth. I didn't say anything, okay? Well, if you say anything again, then you really know. Oh, no, that's it. I don't know exactly what you okay, said, but you, you say it again. Exactly. But you say it again. I want to hear it now. That's the same. Hey,
Johnny um, did his last show in uh, Tokyo. How did he look to you? Well, my point, you know, you know, I think uh, most of the kids expected him uh, the days of heartbreakers. <laughs> Speedy, hard, uh, rock and roll thing, you know, like heartbreakers. First time he came to Tokyo, 90, 1985, you know. But for the kids, for the you know critics, and for the Japanese people, Johnny Sanders is a is a kind of a you know cult hero, cult, you know. But 1991 is a four years over, before show, so all the concerts were sold out. It. But that time, 1991, Johnny won't go to more root music, like blues, R&B, R&B debut, be like Bisman Blues Review, you know. So that time, uh, his show uh, is a kind of R&B review, you know. So more slow songs, slow blues songs, you know, Ray Charles songs, you know. So I think some kids are afraid of frustration, you know. But Johnny said to me, you know, I, I go to New Orleans, I want to make a more blues-oriented album, you know, blues music album. One song is called Society Make Me Sad. Society makes me sad. So he gave me a lyrics seat, you know. That time, the original, original, you know, line, was society makes me scared, scared. You but I talked to Johnny, you should change to society make me sad. So he sang, uh, the next day he sang uh, society makes me sad. You know? yeah. Yeah, this is a lyrics seat Johnny gave, us, gave me, you know, society make me scared. He said to me, he took this kind of sentence, took from Nietzsche, you know, very famous philosophy, Nietzsche book. If money he got you know in Tokyo but I think maybe uh, over uh, $50,000 is whole show you know one one time I asked to Johnny how much money you spend for the drug he said maybe you know $400 no no no, no. Uh, $4,000 in a month mm -hmm. Tell me about the very last night that you spent with Johnny and what happened, okay? I mean, don't forget, Johnny was, um, after that, a few weeks later, Johnny was dead. So it's an important um, time to uh, describe, you know? So if you can maybe, like, remember. Uh, no, I mean? cannot say uh, true story. I cannot say true story. No? He shoot cocaine because everybody think I gave him cocaine. It's oh, really? No good. So yeah. you, you can't talk about that? Yeah, it's no good. If you gave me $1,000, I don't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, with Johnny... I already talked to the... He called to... 
He asked me to call some Japanese local Laura, so nobody's there. He couldn't get it. Anyway, he couldn't get it. Just a very few gram. Not gram, just a one or two lines. You know? But you don't want to talk about it on camera? Of course. You, you do not, or yes? No? Please cut it, okay. this story. Do I feel... We were in Thailand and um, there was like a military coup going on and the, the airport was deserted. Johnny had no medication. He didn't have the medication that he'd managed to get in Japan. He immediately saw these three guys and they sort of nodded and said, yeah, come follow us. And then next thing, we knew the whole room. It was just, it was just full of hands. It was all over the floor. Everywhere. It, was just all over. it was that much of it. And the hotel staff were getting definitely sus to what was, what was going on. And I didn't really want to let the, They asked me what flight we were leaving on. They actually asked me when we were leaving what flight we were on. And when they said what flight are you on, I thought, well. So I told them the flight the day after that we actually left. And we left a day early. We paid for the hotel for an extra day. And we left just one by one. <laughs> My uncle bought that in Germany. He was really, well, from what they told me, he really dug that picture a lot. I think he was going to turn around and put this on the front of his guitar. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what he was going to do with it, but I, I think that's what he was going to do with it because he always had, like, the Mother Mary or, or pictures of Jesus on the front of his guitar. But um, it was the last thing he bought. You know, it really does mean a lot. When we got to Cologne, we checked in the hotel and we went out for something to eat. And Johnny was just, uh, you know, every homeless person that he passed, he gave him some money. And he was, he was buying pictures, religious pictures. He called me and he told me he lost his airline ticket to New Orleans. And I asked him, I said, what do you want me to do? And he said to me, well, I said, do you need money? I said, do you need me to buy you another ticket? No, he says, I have lots of money. I said, then why are you calling and aggravating me? I said, just go to New Orleans. <laughs> no smoking in this airport. He just don't give a fuck, right? He's walking through this airport. Goes to check in, and took one look at him and said, um, sorry, but we, we don't think that uh, you can fly without having a medical. Off we goes to this, like, medical center. We went back to the counter, and as we were walking back to the counter, you know, we're talking, and Johnny bumped into this pillar, and he cut his eye, right? So there's blood running down, his, down the side of his face. And we gets back to the counter after he's been for the medical, and it looked worse than before he went. The next phone call I got from Johnny, he was so happy. It was unbelievable. He, all he kept saying was, Mayor, you can't believe this place. There's musicians right outside on the street playing music. 
He said, they're all over the place around here. He said, I can't wait, he says, to live here. We just talked about him moving there and how excited that things were going to be different now. He was going to change. Everything was going to change. And everything was going to be good. And he told me not to worry about anything. And he brought me back this card. And that's, that's a card again. And it says, uh, Dear Mick, thanks for all your help. Please take care. Your friend, JT. Then he got the flight. And I went back to the UK. And I just felt like there was something really, something was wrong. And that was the last time I spoke to him. They brought the body out in a body bag. So I didn't actually see the body itself. But. Hmm. And you mentioned some of the characters that were with Johnny or around Johnny? Oh, he, neighborhood uh, street hustlers. Yeah, so can you describe a little bit, tell me about that situation? I don't even know their names. Uh, one of them, I think, is named Hank, but I couldn't swear to it. Um, dirty looking, torn jeans, greasy hair, that type. Um, usually walking around like in tank tops and torn jeans and Things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happened? What, the one of them with the blondish hair uh, showed up, I believe, the next day uh, wearing his hat. The same leopard skin hat he had had on that morning that he came in here. You know what I like? Is that like the story about the hat? I think it's a great story. The hat, yeah, but see, with the hat, the thing with the hat, it, 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 may make the police think there was something more happening than there was. What happened was, actually, I don't even want to put this on film, man. Really? Because it's dangerous. He showed me a passport. And, you know, it said his name, Johnny Thunder, I believe. And uh, we just became friends right there. <laughs>
Hello? Yeah. Yeah. We're almost finished. I think one time she told me that she caught him having sex with a chicken, but I didn't believe that. Did you ever hear that story before? Three. The blood, the blood of rock and roll, rock and roll. 